So this is, this, my plan is a, a bit ambitious and I know probably I will only cover two thirds of the material in the slides. And this gives you also, um, well, we have a little bit of choice and flexibility on how, how we want to go about doing this. Um, but definitely I would, what I would like to um, discuss is some general results on linking games, which are a class of games that I will uh, define properly in a minute. And, um, and in particular, what, what I sort of the, the main contribution here is that um, myself with my co-authors, we provide some general results on the existence of a, a so-called value for the game when players do not necessarily observe the same underlying stochastic processes and they're not necessarily equally informed about the structure of the game. Um, and this, so the first part, the first part will be um, concerning essentially some abstract results. And then I will present one um, of these two problems that are listed as item three or four, where actually I show you how the, um, in some cases, this, this value can be computed to some extent explicitly, and also the optimal um, strategies of these players can also, can also be characterized. Um, the, this, so the talk is based, is, is based mainly on three papers, which I wrote with um, Eric Ekstrom, uh, Chris Glover, Nikita Merkulov, and uh, Jan Palczewski. And um, so the most recent paper is the one that contains the general theoretical results. And this is the, the paper with uh, Nikita and Jan. And the two examples are contained in the other two papers. So I'll most likely be able to cover this one in detail. And I think I will cover this perhaps a little bit rushed and maybe we'll leave this one for another time. So, okay, thinking games are essentially, these are games where there are um, players who can end the game, essentially. Okay, so there, there are players that observe some underlying stochastic dynamics and they receive a payoff at the end of the game and the payoff depends on, on, the, on the underlying stochastic dynamics. So the, the only decision that players can make in this type of games is to end the game, right? So they... And that's why they're called games of stopping. So players stop playing, and that's that's their decision. And there is these games are incredibly popular in stochastic control, and they have uh, I mean, they have a long history that goes back to the seventies, and um, they were initiated by Dinking, who suggested this this class of games. But if you look at what you know, the initial definition of games that Dinking gave and the current um, formulation of Dinking games, you see that there would be a, a quite a big gap. And this gap was filled over uh, nearly 50 years of research um, from, from various authors. And I will not list any of the authors because I'm being a little bit sloppy here. But uh, if you're curious, you know, I can show you the, the, the list of references later on. Now, the, um, the thing is that the key feature about these games that I'm talking about today is this lack of complete information, which is different to the standard setup. So this long body of literature over the, that spans the past 50 years is actually concerned with games where players are absolutely equally informed, everything is observable, everybody is completely uh, aware of what's going on. And, and if you start relaxing these, these assumptions, which is reasonable from the point of view of applications, the mathematics becomes a lot more involved. And in particular, we will see that the strategies that need to be used are not the same ones that you would use in a classical game where everybody is equally informed. So this literature on linking games with incomplete information um, draws on uh, general ideas in stochastic differential games with asymmetric information. And the, the main um, papers in this direction um, were, were produced, I mean, the, 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 the people who initiated this, this, this area of research are probably uh, Pierre Cardaliaghe and Catherine Reiner, and, uh, and then the, the, their collaborators later on. And the idea is that when so stochastic differential games are slightly different in the sense that players have the ability to control the underlying stochastic dynamics. So in a sense, these are a, a richer class of games, right? Thinking games is only about stopping. Stochastic differential games is about 
affecting the, the underlying dynamics with actions taken by the players. But the, 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 the take home message from the stochastic differential games with asymmetric information is that you need to use randomized strategies if you want to deal with asymmetric information. And we will see that the same thing happens in linking games. And I, I'll tell you what randomized strategies are. Um, so specifically for thinking games, so games where there is this um, stopping um, action, um, in the case of asymmetric information, the literature is not very vast. There are very few papers, and the main ones, I think there are probably four or five, and the main ones are uh, by Christine Grün and Fabienne Genswitter, and they're both connected with Katrin Reiner in various ways. So the, this is, is not by chance that they, they continue working in, in, this, in this area. And the main mm, approach they take in these papers is that they set up their game and then they write down a variational inequality, which is a, a PD problem essentially. And they prove that it's possible to uh, obtain a viscosity solution of this variational inequality and this viscosity solution coincides with the value of the gain. And it, this is, it may sound quite um, standard in some sense, but it is not entirely standard because even though they deal with viscosity solutions, the variational problems that they study are very different from the ones that you would normally find if games were played with uh, full and symmetric information. So in this sense, you know, I, I want to give them credit for actually, you know, it, they, they do viscosity theory on a class of problems, which is really non-trivial. Um, so the next thing is this, this idea of randomizing strategies that comes from Cataliaghi and Reiner. And in the context of stopping times, the randomization of stopping times has goes, you know, is something that is connected with work that goes back again, 50 years or more. Uh, with papers by Baxter and Chacon and Meyer. And essentially a randomized stopping time, I will define it in a minute, is, 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 a, a one -to, is associated one-to-one -one with an increasing process. Uh, and that's why it's sort of, there is a lot of um, intersection with the general theory of stochastic processes. And the final um, ingredient that I will use is a um, min-max theorem. Uh, which was um, proven by Sion in 1958. And uh, essentially this is a theorem that tells you under which conditions you can swap a mean and a max operator um, in, in an optimization problem. And this idea of using these mean max theorems, um, it goes back at least to, in the context of thinking games, it goes back at least to a paper in 2002 by to ZMBA where they use it for a different purpose is not because of um, asymmetric information but still they i mean i, I learned about this this mean max theorem by reading this paper here okay right let's let's uh, start talking about the general results so i need to so there is a bit of terminology from the general theory of stochastic processes that i will try to introduce quickly but uh, not too quickly hopefully so we, we start with this uh, classical uh, complete probability space with a filtration. And we will deal, we'll be dealing with processes X from a class uh, calligraphic L. And these are um, real valued Cadillac uh, measurable with respect to the product sigma algebra of uh, Borel over time and F is the sigma algebra on the probability space. Um, and the important thing is that these processes are um, bounded in expectation. I'm not requiring, I'm not specifying any uh, property regarding, you know, adaptivity of these stochastic processes. So for now, I'm not specifying any filtration because that's, that's the, the point essentially, that players will, will use different filtrations. Um, so in particular, we also consider a subclass of this uh, class L which is the class of regular processes. Regular processes essentially are processes that in, in very loose terms, we could say if they do jump at a predictable time, then the jump is uh, on average zero, the jump size is zero on average, uh, conditional on the um, filtration just before the, the jump. So essentially, if you can predict that this process is going to jump, you cannot 
uh, predict uh, the size or the direction of the jump in, in some sense, because on average, this would be zero. Um, the class of regular processes is, is, is really broad. So quasi-left continuous processes are regular. Standard macro processes are regular. Strong and weak solutions or stochastic differential equations are regular. Um, now we start introducing the, the concept of information. This is done, as you may expect, using filtrations. So two players have two different filtrations. And both filtrations are um, sub-filtrations of the original one, which we used to set up the probability space. Now, the thing is that the, the key point that I want to make is that F1 and F2 need not be the same. Uh, in general, they will be different. And they may be strictly smaller than the overall overarching filtration F. Okay, so, and this essentially, this measures the amount of information available to each player. And also it, it, it will allow us to discriminate between different sources of information. The game goes as follows. So as I, as I mentioned earlier several times, players are only allowed to choose when to end the, the competition. And in particular, player one selects a random time tau and player two selects a random time sigma. And I'm not saying these are stopping times. These are, these are for now, these are generic random times. The game ends when, you know, whenever the, the first player stops. Um, and when they stop, um, they, they exchange an amount. In particular, player one is paying player two an amount which is described by this function here. So in particular, uh, if player one stops first, they will pay F tau to player two. If they wait for player two to stop, then player one will pay G uh, of sigma. And then if they stop simultaneously, they exchange an intermediate payoff. And um, here, F and G and H are stochastic processes, and that's why they depend on the time at which the game ends. So in this context, given that player, player one is paying something to player two, it's natural that player one should be the minimizer and player two should be the maximizer. Okay. Is the setting so far sufficiently clear? Okay. Yeah, yes, of course, you can. Right. Then you okay. I'm not sure how familiar uh, the audience is with uh, linking games. Um, <clears throat> right, so we need some technical assumptions on these processes F, G, and H. Now, for the purpose of understanding the main ideas in the talk, it's not so important that you follow entirely what, um, what these assumptions are. But let's say, for the sake of trying to appreciate the generality of the setting, I would like to still spend a few words on, on these assumptions. So the first thing is that F and G are um, catalog and uh, bounded in expectation. So they satisfy this condition that the, supreme, the soup of um, FT plus F, sorry, plus GT is finite. And this is the definition of our space L. Um, and then we, we can decom decompose these processes in the sum of two objects. So the tilde part of the processes are adapted and regular processes. So these are those processes that whose predictable jumps have zero average conditional on the uh, filtration just before the jump. And then the hat part of the process is just a, a piecewise constant component of these processes. And, um, and they have integrable variation. I have to select the direction somehow. So either the jumps of the F hat, so the, the are, are non-increasing or the jumps in G hat are non-decreasing. And, and this is in line with the fact that otherwise you shouldn't expect the value to exist. But, uh, I'll leave it as a, as a side comment. The, I think the only assumption that you may want to remember really from now onwards is this one, which is saying that the payoff the players exchange at the end of the game are ordered. So the min if the minimizer stops first, they exchange F. If the maximizer stops first, they exchange G. So you see that from the perspective of the minimizer, stopping 
first has a larger cost than letting the other player stop first. So this, in, this, in this game, there is a second mover advantage in the sense that each player would prefer the other player to stop. The thing is that eventually one of them will stop for reasons that are related to the, the dynamics of F or G. So even so, it's, the game is non-trivial in the sense that it's not a game where nobody stops. Okay, because but in locally at each at each key instant in time, the each player would prefer the other player to stop first. These are called second mover games with second mover advantage, or sometimes they're also called uh, war of attrition games. Um, and the intermediate payoff is just what they exchange if they stop simultaneously. And this is uh, something in between uh, F and G, which is simply uh, adapted and, and measurable. So there is, uh, well, essentially here, I'm not requiring that this be either right continuous or left continuous. It's just a, it's just a gen generic FT adapted measurable process. Okay, doke. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is that in these type of games, we need uh, to use randomized stopping times. And randomized stopping times, <clears throat> there are various definitions, but more or less they're all equivalent. And the one that we adopt here uh, is, is, uh, is the following. If I take a subfiltration G of, of, of the overarching filtration F, I, I can define the class of G-adapted um, right continuous or cat-like processes rho, uh, which are non-decreasing. They start from zero at zero minus, meaning that there could be an initial jump at time zero, and they end at time t uh, taking the value one. So these are non-decreasing cat-like processes that start from zero and end up in one, and they are G-adapted. This class is necessary to define randomized stopping times in the following way. I can say that a, a random variable eta is a G-randomized stopping time. So I need to mention which filtration I'm, I'm using in the construction of this randomized stopping time. If it is defined as the first time, uh, the process row, which comes from the class of catalog increasing processes, exceeds a random variable z. And this random variable z is uniformly distributed in 0, 1, and is independent of everything, essentially. This z is this exogenous randomization device that uh, is used to randomize the strategy. So randomization is, randomized strategies are, are very well understood in game theory, and, uh, and they're used also in deterministic games. So this is not something that has anything to do with the fact that I use stochastic processes, okay? So there are, if you take the classical, um, the prisoner dilemma is, is an example of a game which is fully deterministic, finite states, finite choices for the players, and you cannot find an equilibrium in pure strategies, but you can find equilibrium in uh, randomized strategies. The idea is that essentially, if, if you choose a pure strategy, you are acting based upon only the observation of your system. And this sometimes is not good enough to be able to find an equilibrium. So you add a bit of exogenous randomness saying this, you can think of it as flipping a coin and saying, if when I flip my coin, I get ahead, I will make action, I'll take action one. If when I flip my coin, I get uh, tails, I will take action two. And this is, uh, is essentially saying that you are, in some sense, indifferent between taking two different actions, depending on the outcome of some exogenously given random variable. Um, I hope this makes some sense. The class of randomized stopping strategies is denoted by this TR, which again needs to uh, keep into account the, the, the filtration which is being used. And we say that the increasing process row generates the randomized stopping time eta. Okay, right, now we have all the ingredients in place and I've got my payoff. I take the expectation of this payoff because obviously we are uh, dealing with a stochastic game. So we, we evaluate expected payoffs uh, for the players. And then we have, um, we, we, we select the essentially the, the optimization procedure for, for, for both players. 
so the minimizer is uh, minimizing over the class of randomized stopping times with respect to the filtration F1. So they select increasing processes that are adapted to the filtration that they can observe. And the maximizer is instead selecting randomized stopping times with respect to the filtration F2, and then maximizing the, the payoff. And now the thing is that in general, um, it's not clear a priori that you can swap super nymph. Okay, so this is this is why a priori we can only define a lower value in the game, which is when we take the infimum and the supremum in this order, and we can define an upper value for the game when infant super swapped. In general, we have that v star is strictly bigger than v. Uh, sorry, the, the upper value is strictly larger than the lower value. In special cases, relatively, I mean, in a quite in a, in a quite broad class of examples, one can prove that um, the game is a value, which is what I'm, my talk is mainly about. And in particular, the value exists when the the upper value and the lower value of the game uh, coincide. Okay. Then, so the first thing is is determining whether or not the game has a value, which is a um, sort of minimum requirement for for the game to be interesting. Um, and then the second thing is to see whether players can actually attain this value by selecting a pair of randomized stopping times. So an admissible pair tau star sigma star, oops, sorry, this is happening at one. An admissible pair uh, tau star sigma star is a subtle point or a, a pair of optimal strategies if when um, the minimizer changes, deviates from tau star and picks another uh, admissible time uh, tau, they get a larger payoff. So given that they're minimizing, they wouldn't want to do this, okay? So essentially this situation is undesirable for the minimizer who will then prefer to play tau star over any other tau, given that the other player is playing sigma star. And likewise, if the maximizer changes from sigma star to another admissible sigma, they receive the, the expected payoff uh, that they exchange is smaller than if they use sigma star. So again, given that the sigma player is a maximizer, this is an undesirable situation and they will prefer to play sigma star provided that the other player plays tau star. So as you see, this couple essentially is a couple which forces the players to uh, stick to this, to avoid deviations from, from, from the, from the subtle point. However, it's not uh, necessarily the case that there is a unique uh, such subtle point. Okay, so you can select several, in, 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 in a priori there are several possible choices of tau star and sigma star that may provide a subtle point. And the other observation is that that if you can prove that there exists a subtle point, then each subtle point will give you the existence of the value. And the value will be the same whatever subtle point you select, right? So in theory, if you can prove the existence of a subtle point, you have for free the existence of the value. And in some sense, players are indifferent across different subtle points because the value they exchange is always the same. But the other direction is not true. So if the value exists, it's not clear that you can select a, a pair of optimal strategies. Okay, so the main theorem in this paper with uh, Jan Palczewski and Nikita Merkulov, uh, they're both in Leeds, by the way, uh, which is uh, Nikita was a PhD student of mine, he's finished now. Um, so under the assumptions that I've stated uh, regarding the, the processes F, G, and H, uh, the game has a value randomized strategies. Okay, so in that in the setup that I described, there is always a game. There is always a value for this game. Moreover, if I, if you may remember at some point, I say that there has to be some monotonicity for the processes G hat and F hat. So I as a reminder, F was decomposed as F tilde plus F hat, and this was a regular part, and this was a piecewise constant process. And I said, um, and then there is the same decomposition for G, it was G tilde plus G hat with an analogous meaning. And I was saying that one of these two processes has to be monotonic. 
Now, if I strengthen my assumption and I impose that they're both monotonic, the correct monotonicity, so that f hat is non increasing and g hat is non decreasing, then I can also prove that there exists a pair of optimal strategies. Mm, what is missing here is that uh, I cannot tell you exactly what these optimal strategies look like. So I cannot mm, characterize tau star and sigma star in some, in, some, in some form. I can only say there exists a pair of optimal strategies. So one interesting thing in this paper, I think, is that we show in the paper that the assumptions are minimal in the sense that we start relaxing uh, one assumption at a time without strengthening the other ones. And we prove in each case that there is a counterexample. So it's not possible to find values in these games if you want to um, relax individually one of our assumptions. Let me try to give you a flavor for the proof. So the first thing is that um, using this um, correspondence between tau, between randomized stopping times and increasing processes, um, we can rewrite the expected payoff of the game in terms of the increasing processes that gener generate the randomized stopping times. So if you remember, tau, for example, was the first time when a process psi t exceeds a random variable z. Um, and likewise, and this would be z1, and then likewise I have the inf over t such that um, another process zeta exceeds another randomization device for the second player. Now if, and, and we assume that z1 and z2 are independent mutually independent. So if we use this, uh, if you recall this definition of randomized stopping times and you do a little bit of calculations, you can rewrite the expected payoff in terms of these increasing processes. And there is a clear intuitive meaning for all these terms that crop up. And the interpretation is the following. Uh, let me give you everything. So the first thing is that the process psi essentially is the probability that the randomized stop in time tau has not occurred prior to time t, given all the information contained in the filtration of player one. And this, can, this is a simple calculation that you can do in two lines using the fact that uh, uh, this is the tau is the first time the process psi goes above a uniformly distributed random variable, which is independent of everything. So if you accept this fact, then you can see that dx i t is the probability density function conditional on f1 of the stopping distribution at time t. So in some sense, dx i t measures the intensity with which the, the, the player one will stop in an interval of time between t and t plus dt. So if you want to put it this way, I can say that dx i t is in very loose terms is the probability of player one stopping in the interval t, t plus dt. Um, which uh, also leads to the fact that um, essentially when you look at um, this part of the function of this, of this expression, this is measuring you know, you see, you integrate the payoff, the stopping payoff of the first player, and you integrate it against the intensity of stopping for the first player. And this is multiplied by this one minus zeta, which is exactly the probability that the other player hasn't stopped yet. Likewise, here, this is the probability that the first player has not stopped. This is the payoff that, uh, they exchange if the second player stops first, and it is integrated against the intensity of stopping of the second player. And then simultaneous stopping can only happen if there is a jump in these increasing processes, psi and zeta, and the jump is simultaneous. So somehow this is trying to map the tau sigma notation into this zeta uh, psi notation. And um, what is the advantage? Okay, and then the other thing is that I will use this from now on. So this n 
to make sure that from now on we deal ma mainly with um, psi and zeta. And so I use n of psi and zeta to represent the expected payoff understood in terms of this expression at the top of the slide. And what is the advantage of dealing with these increasing processes? Well, the advantage is that you can um, embed the, the space of increasing processes with a nice topology, with a lot, which will allow us to prove some compactness properties and use this Sion min max theorem that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so the first thing, first step in the proof is to recognize that you can write your problem in this form. Second step in the proof is to introduce an auxiliary uh, game. Uh, where you take a slightly smaller class of uh, increasing processes. So you now, you, you now take increasing processes that are absolutely continuous uh, as functions of time on the interval zero capital T with a possible jump only at time capital T. And we define an, an, an auxiliary game in which uh, the minimizer cannot, you know, has their strategy restricted to this smaller class. Why do we do that? Well, this is again for sort of topological reasons and compactness arguments that we want to use. Um, but the, so this auxiliary game has the following relationship with the original one. Given that we are taking a smaller class of admissible uh, controls for the minimizer, the lower value and the upper value of this auxiliary game are both larger than the corresponding lower value and upper value of the original game. Then we prove, and this is not shown here in the slides, that the lower values of the auxiliary game and the original game actually coincide. And so we get this chain of inequalities. So now we can squeeze the lower value and the upper value of the original game between the lower value and the upper value of the auxiliary game. And now you can guess that if we can prove that the auxiliary game has a value, they, we are closing this gap and we are sandwiching uh, V in between W lower, w lower star, oh, sorry, W with the subscript star and W with the superscript star. So the final step is to prove that the lower value and upper value in the auxiliary game coincide. Um, and this is an easier task than the original task because essentially ha having a little bit more regularity on the controls of the of one of the players allows to pass to the limit in some in some um, arguments in the proof and i'll give you very uh, sort of high level idea of what's happening next so as i say the advantage of using increasing processes is that we can um, put these increasing processes embed them into a topological space and uh, in particular, I consider L2 space on the zero T times omega equipped with the, uh, this is the Lebesgue measure over times and the P is the original probability measure. And on this space, I put the weak topology of L2. Now, what it turns out is that when you take this topological setting, uh, these two uh, classes of admissible strategies are convex uh, which is not difficult to prove. But uh, what, is, what is relevant is that the um, increasing, so the Cadillac processes that generate the randomized stopping times for the maximizer, so this is the original class of increasing processes, is weakly compact in S. Then we can prove that when we fix psi and we look at uh, the expected payoff as a function of the uh, process zeta of, um, of the maximizer. This function is quasi-concave and it's upper semi-continuous, again, uh, when we think of a continuity in terms of the weak topology in S. And here we, re so, okay, this part of the proof would normally fail if zeta was also taken from the class a. That's why we need to take the class A restricted to absolutely continuous paths. Okay, so this, this enables to prove this quasi-concavity and upper semi Actually, the, uh, yes, both, both things, quasi-concavity and upper semi-continuity weakliness. 
And then with an argument which is somewhat similar, we can also show that when we fix um, zeta, sorry, I, I think I was getting this wrong. So psi must be in the, in the restricted class. And, and then if we fix zeta in, the, uh, in, in A, in the class of, a, of all Cadillac uh, increasing processes, then uh, this mapping is also quasi-convex and lower semi-continuous in uh, weekly in S. Why do we need all these things? We need all these things because these are exactly the requirements that are needed to apply Sion's theorem, which now tells us that uh, it's possible to swap uh, minim, min, this is a min-max theorem in the sense that this theorem tells us that we can swap infant soup in the ordering and therefore the upper value and the lower value for the auxiliary gain coincide. So this is, uh, Sion's theorem is used to prove that the, the equality of this uh, upper and lower value in the auxiliary gain. Sion's theorem also gives us something else. It gives us an, uh, an optimal, it gives us a maximizer for the, uh, for, 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 for player two, who's, who's, the, who's the maximizer. So that there exists a zeta star that attains the maximum in this optimization problem. Now, the, the thing is that the R game, we haven't made any assumptions on the sign of F, G, and H. So we can swap the roles of player one and player two by simply considering a game with minus the, the payoff of the original game, repeat the same arguments, and obtain, obtain essentially the same result for this um, game with, with, the, with the minus sign. And, and this gives us um, an optimal strategy for the minimizer. Now, in order, the only thing that would break this symmetry is if we were not assuming that F hat and G hat are monotonic. And that's why, if you remember the statement of the theorem, the theorem says the value always exists. And if we restrict F hat and G hat to be monotonic, then there also exists a couple of optimal uh, randomized stopping times. And, and the reason for this additional requirement is because we need to have a fully symmetric uh, setup. Okay, there should have been something here, no? no. Tiziano, right. this is just yes. to let you know that formally you have 20 minutes, so yes. I don't think you will be able to describe both the two problems. I know, I know, I know. This, this was planned. This was planned. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. you can invite me once again to give you the, the, the <laughs> second part of the talk. Okay. Right, let's see an application of what, of what I just described. Um, so we have, this is now, I will, I will describe a specific game. So this is a game where we have um, two random variables, theta and u, and the Brownian motion w. Every, all the three things are mutually independent, and theta is Bernoulli with distribution pi uh, and one minus pi, and u is uniformly distributed on zero one. So as you can guess, this will be the randomization device, and this is some unknown or partially observable parameter in the game. The underlying dynamics uh, is, a, is a stochastic differential equation. So now I'm restricting uh, to a problem where my process ft will be a function of xt and my process gt will be a function of xt. And the process xt is just a geometric Brownian motion, but the drift of this geometric Brownian motion depends on the realization of the random variable theta. So it could be a negative drift if theta is zero and it, or a positive drift if theta is one. In this game, um, there are two players. I need to apologize here because I am, I think at some point I slightly changed the notation, but there are two players and uh, they exchange this payoff, x and one plus epsilon x gamma uh, x. So you can think of this, for example, um, I'm buying a home in, in Torino, right? So there is all the negotiation with the, with the seller. And the seller wants me to uh, pay one plus epsilon the market price of the property. And I want to pay just the market price of the property, okay? In this game, I'm the minimizer and I would like to pay X, whereas the, uh, the, 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 the owner of, of the, property that I'm trying to buy in Torino 
is the maximizer and they would like me to pay one plus epsilon times x where epsilon is a positive parameter. So in this game, the, uh, the minimizer will play uh, gamma. So if I decide to accept the request from the, from the seller, I will say, okay, I stop, I accept your, uh, your ask and I will pay you one plus epsilon the, the market price of the property at the time when I accept your offer. If the, if the seller instead decides that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very tough at negotiating and they want to sell me their the home because they want to buy elsewhere, they will stop at time tau and they will tell me, okay, I accept your offer and I only pay X. I hope this makes sense. So in this setting, the minimizer chooses gamma and the maximizer chooses tau. Okay, what, what, are, what is the remaining part of the setting? So both players observe the process X. Uh, player two, uh, who's, the, um, who's the minimizer, okay, this is slightly in contrast with my example with purchasing a property, but player two, who's the minimizer, knows what's the true value of theta. So they know the drift of this underlying process. Whereas player one, who's the maximizer, only knows the prior distribution of theta. Moreover, player one can only observe the process X and can never observe directly the, the random variable theta. So they, their filtration is the filtration generated by the observation of the sample part of the process X. Whereas player two essentially knows theta. So player two, the filtration for player two is given by the sample paths of the process X and by the, the, the value of the random variable theta. So this is a situation in which the minimizer has a strictly bigger filtration than the, than the maximizer, and therefore they have a strictly uh, a strict informational advantage. All, all the other parameters are known to the players. And um, so these are, okay, the, the thing here, the only thing that I, that's slightly different to what I was presenting in the first part of the talk is that in the first part of the talk, I say that you can always find the value if you allow both players to randomize. In this example, it turns out that we can find the value even if we say that the least informed player cannot randomize, okay? So I'm saying that the, the maximizer who does not know the true drift of the process only uses stopping times. So they only choose stopping times for the filtration of the observed uh, process X. Whereas the other player uh, chooses randomized stopping times. And in particular, if theta is zero, they select a randomized stopping time gamma zero. And if theta is one, they select another stopping time gamma one. So the generating processes, this you know, psi process that I was using in the first part of the talk, now it's called gamma, and this is the process that generates gamma zero and gamma one. So it's the cad lag increasing process between zero and one. So in this game, there is a learning part, which you couldn't detect in the general setting. And the learning part is that essentially the uninformed player does not know theta, but they observe the sample paths of X and they estimate theta with a, with a variation procedure. So they replace the, uh, the theta parameter in the dynamics with the, the best estimate or the posterior probability that theta is equal to one. And this guy has its own dynamics. So at the end of the day, I end up having a two dimensional Markovian process, which is described in, by this uh, coupled SDE. And the, the, the state variable, which is more convenient to use is the likelihood ratio, which is the ratio between pi and one minus pi. Now, uh, this is two-dimensional, Markovian adapted, everything's fine. And here, I think this is, I'm, I'm sort of coming to, to an end and I will skip a lot of the details, but I think this is one bit which is um, perhaps relevant. Again, this is, you know, when you, from the general theory that I presented, if you, if you specialize to, to particular examples, there is a lot more structure. And this structure allows you to say quite a lot of, other, of additional, uh, things. So the learning procedure here is, um, is somewhat controlled by the more informed player, right? The more informed player who knows the drift wants to act in a way to make things 
um, confusing, if you like, in a very uh, non rigorous uh, language for the least informed player. They want to do something that does not allow the least informed player to detect quickly the true value of the drift. So, and this is described by the following thing. So, if um, there exists a, a pair tau star and gamma star, which is an equilibrium, then <clears throat> the, the way in which the least informed player estimates the, the true value of the drift is affected by the actions of the more informed player. In particular, they, they will estimate an adjusted posterior probability, um, which is given by what? The probability that theta is equal one, given the observation of the process, and given that the informed player hasn't stopped yet. So if you do your algebra, this and gives you an expression here, which features what? It features the uh, likelihood ratio, which can be computed without considering the fact that the informed player has, hasn't stopped. And then it also now displays the, this increasing processes, which are the randomized strategies at equilibrium of the more informed player. And this is more neatly expressed in terms of the posterior likelihood ratio. This is likelihood ratio, of course, I simplify. And in particular, the adjusted posterior likelihood ratio is the classical one. Uh, you know, if the uninformed player just decided not to consider the actions of the, of the informed player, they would only estimate phi. But now that they actually consider what the other player is doing, they also have this ratio that depends on the actions of the other player. Okay, here there is a number of steps that we'll skip, and let's try to understand the heuristic of this problem. So if the drift is negative, player two, uh, who's the uh, minimizer and is informed, so they know the mu is negative, they don't want to stop, right? Because the process X uh, is a super martingale when mu, not, when mu is negative, and therefore in expectation, the longer the game continues for, the smaller the, the payoff they will pay at the end. On the other hand, if player one could somehow be certain that the drift is, is, pos is uh, positive, then they would never stop because they're maximizers. So if they knew that the drift was positive, they would be happy to let the game continue indefinitely because the, pr the process would be uh, a super, a super marketing game. Problem is that player one cannot be certain. So that's, that's where, the, the, where there is a catch. Um, However, player two knows if the drift is positive. In which case, what do they do? They essentially say, okay, for as long as I can fool my opponent into believing that the drift is negative, I shouldn't worry too much. But if my opponent is actually getting their guess right and their, their, their estimation procedure is working fine for them, so if their phi process is, is large, so they have a strong belief that the drift is positive, I need to stop because essentially there is nothing I can hide anymore, right? If my opponent knows that the drift is positive, they will never stop. So this suggests that the, the informed player should stop when the um, uh, adjusted, sorry, when the um, posterior likelihood ratio of the, informed play, of the uninformed player is large. However, they want to randomize. So essentially what they do, they select an upper bound for this uh, phi process, and they stop with a certain intensity every time phi touches this bound. When they uh, implement this stopping with some intensity procedure, this produces an, an adjusted likelihood ratio. So essentially this corresponds to the fact that the uninformed player has a large belief that the drift is positive, but they also see that the, other, the informed player is not stopping, so they say, Perhaps my estimation is a bit biased or is, is, is slightly skewed in the wrong direction, and I need to correct and reduce my belief in a, in a positive drift. And this is as an effect of this um, stopping with a certain intensity from the, from the informed player. Um, and in all cases, instead, the, 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 the maximizer will stop when she has a strong belief that the drift is negative, because that's, that's the undesirable situation for the maximizer. So essentially the idea is that for the informed player, 
we should expect an upper boundary, B, and some randomization procedure happening at this upper boundary. And for the maximizer, we should expect a lower boundary where stopping happens just uh, in a, you know, the first time the adjusted posterior likelihood ratio goes below A, the, 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 the uninformed player stops. So this intuition gives us a way of defining a class of uh, candidates optimal strategies. So we construct a reflecting threshold for uh, in terms of an increasing process that pushes the belief, the adjusted posterior uh, likelihood ratio below B. And then we define a heating time of, uh, of, of some constant value A. This is the candidate. There are 10 more slides that I will skip. You can write down our system of ODEs, prove that this system of ODEs has a unique solution. Uh, and this in particular gives us a unique couple of A and B. And then using this unique solution of this system of ODEs, we can test our conjecture on the optimality of the strategy that I described and verify that the conjecture is correct. So this is an illustration of what's happening. This is written in terms of the process pi t star, right? So what, what I'm plotting here is the posterior probability process, which uh, it was the probability that theta is equal one, given the observation of player one, sorry, given the observation of the process x up to time t, and given that the informed player hasn't stopped. So this is the adjusted posterior probability process. The game starts at time zero. This process starts evolving freely, nothing is happening. When the posterior probability hits this threshold B, the informed player stops with a certain intensity. So the game may or may not end. If the game does not end, because the intensity of stopping is not sufficiently large to um, cross the randomization device, then the, the uninformed player will correct their belief downwards. And they, this has the effect of pushing the pi star process below this level. Then this thing, this procedure repeats uh, every time there is a, um, every time there is a, the, the pi process hits this boundary. And now this game can end in two ways. Either eventually uh, the, the pi star process hits A and the uninformed player decides to stop or the increasing process gamma, which describes the randomization of the player, uh, of the informed player, crosses the value of the randomizing, randomization device, which is this U random variable that I introduced, right? So this is the uniform distributed between zero and one. Um, and so this crossing in particular can only occur at one of the times when the process pi star is at B. So, <clears throat> so this describes the, the strategies and this describes the value. Uh, which I will skip. I think the only, the, the most interesting picture in my opinion is this one, because this gives you a, sort of a clear intuition, hopefully of what's happening. And this is my last slide as well. So this value here, the dashed line is the value of the game that I described as a function of the prior belief on the realization of the random variable T. The solid line instead is the value of the same game if we assume that the players, neither of the players knows theta. So if both players are equally uninformed, there is no informational advantage, the game has a solution which has a value which is described as a function of the, of the pi is the probability that theta is equal one, just to be clear, um, is described by this solid line. So what you observe is that there is a gap the value of the game with asymmetric information is lower, and that's how it should be, because the most informed player in this game is the minimizer. So the minimizer can use their information to actually do better than if they were not informed. And this is just a plot that gives you the difference between the solid line and the dashed line. So this, this essentially quantifies the value of information for the, uh, for the informed player. And I'll stop here. Thank you.